you know, when you're undercover, you must see these guys' IDs sometimes, or no? Or is that kind of not a thing that happens? It depends on, you know, the type of undercover. Like, if it's short-term or regular undercover, um, you, you you know exactly who it is you're meeting with. You know what their background is, what they're capable of, and, and you'll know their names, but it's short-term. Um, when you're doing this long-term, and you particularly when you're meeting, you know, hundreds of people over a period of time, um, you know, the odds of use, because some of them go by their real names. Some of them go by their club names. And so whatever, it's just like I'm introduced to Jordan. You know, if I knew your nickname was Bill and somewhere I referred to you as Bill and you'd be like, where'd you get that from? Mm-hmm. Um, you oh, know, so, I see. Yeah. You know, so yeah, so I, I always told him, just don't tell me, you know, just you, as long as you know who they are. Uh, now you can tell me, you know, hey, how bad are they? Like if they killed five people. So I know, you know, I have that going in. Um, but outside of that, um, don't don't give me much more. Um, yeah, because you don't want to you don't want to say like a gang name that only a gang member would know. And if they haven't introduced you is that way and they've given you something totally different, it just totally blows you up. Right. Because it's like, well, who do you know that knows me that told you my name? Right. Or these guys use aliases all the time and um, they'll throw them out there. And if all of a sudden they threw an alias out five years ago and I happen to use that alias as opposed they'd be like, only a cop would know that. Um, and so you just yeah, you're always trying to stay. I just try to keep it as simple as I can. And, it, and like I said, this type of investigation it's, you know, people are always like, oh, yeah, it's amazing. It's this, it, it, you know, the hardest part of this was keeping your story straight. I bet. For two years. And, um, you know, people have always asked me, like, you know, how do you do it? And I'm like, well, you know, how difficult is it? And, and, and I use the same analogy, which is, so tell me a lie about last night where you went to dinner, who you went with, what was the restaurant, what did you eat, what was the environment, who was sitting around you, and I get into some details. And you'll, you'll sling that out in a second. And, um, and it'll sound very convincing and I'll believe you, but then I'm going to circle back next week and I'm going to come back and I'm going to say to you, Hey, um, how did you have your steak cooked last week? And you would have told me, and if it was a real memory, you'd remember it. If it's not, then it's very hard to recall because you just made that stuff up. And so then do that over two years. Um, and it gets to be really difficult. And these guys would regularly, particularly roadblock would regularly circle back on my um, stories to see how valid they were. Roadblock is one of the guys in the, was that the guy that sort of sponsored you to see if you were, or was he just a guy that, that, it's hard to keep these names straight for me having read the book. There was one guy who kept testing you. I assume that's what it, that's who that was, yeah? Yeah, there's, I mean, him and Peter, probably the, the, the two biggest when it came to testing, but uh, Roadblock was my sponsor. Um, and that he was, at the time, he's a sergeant at arms. the 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 chapter president wanted me wanted me into the club, but uh, presidents generally are not supposed to sponsor folks. So he designated Roadblock to be my sponsor. Yeah, so that's that seems to be one of the reasons why you hear undercovers say like, always use as many real details as you can, so that you don't have. You can always default to like, hey, I get my steaks done medium. This I am a maybe I'm a vegan, you know, yeah. or a vegetarian. You don't have to pretend you're not or that you are for something else and maybe you use like what like a real first name but a fake last name is that kind of the general yeah gist? most folks will use their real first name because you know i mean especially again if, if i'm going to an alley and meeting you and buying a gun and it's gonna be a half hour whatever you know you can stay focused for that but you, over a two-year period if all of a sudden i changed my name to harry there inevitably somebody would have been like hey harry and i wouldn't have turned around i you know like you just wouldn't click um, whereas if you keep the same first name, you know, you can, you know, you'll naturally respond. Yeah, that's, oh man, the pressure is just ridiculous. Uh, let me back up a little bit. How did you end up deciding to slash getting selected to work undercover? Do they, I assume they don't make you do that. They ask you if you want to, right? Yeah, you talking all the way back at like day one of my career? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they do not make you do it. Um, it, When you're in the academy, uh, at least when I went to the academy, everyone was, um, you had to do it in that environment. So you could at least, for two reasons, one, see if you liked it. Number two, you have to have an appreciation of what it's like to be an undercover. And again, it's an academy environment. Nobody's going to die, but it is, they do make it as real as they possibly can. And even if you never did it again, you'll understand what undercovers go through. And when you are planning your operations and you're asking someone to do undercover for you, you'll, you know, you'll have a little bit more understanding of how that process works and what they're going through when they're doing that. So, um, but then afterwards, it's just for me, you know, I did it in the academy um, and, you know, I thought I did pretty good at it. And I also felt like 
a lot of the undercover work was kind of pushed on to um, different minority groups. And so it'd be like, hey, you look the part type of thing. And I always oh. felt like, you know, looking the part is, I mean, there's, you got to look, you got to be able to explain what you look like. And so, yeah. um, you know, I did um, undercover with um, African-American gangs, Hispanic gangs. Like it's all your story and who's introducing you in. So I did, uh, you know, a fair amount of undercover with MS, the, the Maris of the, the street gang. And everyone's like, how's a white guy, you know, do that? Yeah, isn't well, that is that El Salvador uh, yeah. based gang? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so they were this is when I was in Los Angeles and they were big in Los Angeles. And um it, but my story was there was a um a prostitute who worked down in that area who's white, and um she introduced me into into the gang. So I was her brother. And so then they accepted that, like, all right, yeah, we got this white guy here, he's, you know, buying some guns and some drugs and, and what have you. And um, so it's really your story more so than it is what you look like. And so I wanted to kind of change that. And then further I, I went along with it um, or got into it, um, the more I enjoyed doing it. it. You know, I looked at it as a, a challenge. It's almost like a chess match. Um and, um, you know, I, I, I was not one dimensional in my career and, and I never intended to, uh, you know, I worked, you know, really good cases. I had gone up into management up to the highest levels within the agency. So it was, you know, all these things, I, I just wanted to be a well-rounded agent. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like the level of excitement for undercover is much higher than, I mean, I'm stereotyping here, but it seems like if you want, if you join in the police or the ATF in your case, to be close to the action, there's no closer to the action than pretending to be in a gang and selling drugs with a gang and running guns with a gang for whether it's half an hour or half a year. Some would view it that way. And I, I think yeah. it's, it's, but there's also, you know, if you're on the SRT team, you know, there's a lot of adrenaline in That's that That's like a role. SWAT team situation. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah exactly. And so um, there's a lot of aspects of the job that get that adrenaline you know, flowing. And, um, but this, this to me was one where, um, it's kind of like a skill set and you develop it as you go along and you get a little bit better. You, you have to be very quick in thinking because even the short term stuff, you know, all of a sudden something comes up and somebody throws something at you, you've got to be able to respond to it just like you naturally would. Um, and this case was full of, uh, you know, things that happened that you, I would get out of bed every day and, you know, I'd have a plan on what I was going to do. By nine o'clock in the morning, that plan completely was blown up. And not a single day went according to what I thought it was going to do. Yeah, it sounded like that from the book, too. You know, like, this is a full-time job, and, and I, we'll kind of get to this, because I, I took a copious amount of notes. But tell me a little bit about how biker gangs work. There's different club ranks, right? There's, like, the full-on patched members, and then there's these kind of, I guess, prospects who are, for lack of a better word, like applicants almost, right? Initiates. <laughs> More like indentured slaves, but yeah. the the um, so the process starts with hangarounds, and so hangarounds actually, you know, if you're ever going to hang around a biker gang, that's the that's the level you want to be at because they get to go to the parties, they have no responsibility, nobody cares what they do, they're also not involved in any of the inner workings of the club, um, they won't know any of the criminal activities, they won't know a lot of anything, any of the dynamics that are happening inside, but they go to the clubs, you know, they go to the parties, they'll support them and so forth, and that's but. It, for the biker gangs, that's an important part because they're watching you and how you are just normally. And so they're wanting to see, you know, is this a stand up type of person? Is this somebody we want to be part of this? Um, do they have what it takes to be a part of it? And then if you do, the next phase, they're going to ask you to prospect. And that is by far the worst phase. And um, it, it's a little bit different for each club. But for the pagans, it's six months, the, the period. Um, and they can add days to it. Um, depending on what happens. And, and during that period of time, you and with the pagans, you're a prospect for the what they consider to be the entire pagan nation. So you don't belong to a chapter, you don't belong to a person, you belong to the entire pagan group. So it, when on a normal day, you know, you're you're beholden to the to the chapter that you're in. But when you go to these mandatories, where there's, you know, a 1000 bikers there, you're beholden to every single one of them. And so it is like indentured servitude. You you will, um, so like my first uh, mandatory, we were up, uh, well, it was actually like a half a mandatory. We were up at four o'clock in the morning after, you know, maybe going to sleep at three o'clock in the morning. And um, you're running the grills, you're going around picking up trash, 
you you have these bags of things that you have to carry with you. Things being like spark plugs, um, uh, lights for the motorcycle, cigarettes, tampon, like you name it. You're carrying all this stuff. And there's a list. Like figure you have to have a lighter, you know, all this stuff. Toothpicks. Um, and if you don't have one of these items and one of those members ask you for it, it, several things can happen. One, they'll bang check you, which is an open palm strike to your forehead. Two, they can hit, hit, whack you with an axe handle if it's significant enough. I mean, if you're missing a toothpick, you're probably not going to get an axe handle. But um, if you, um, other violations you would, or they add days to your prospecting. And so you have this little calendar booklet you carry with you and you cross off days as you complete them. And, um, and so if you screw up, It'd be like, hey, add another week. Which honestly, I'd rather get. I'd rather get bank checked than add time to to the um, to the prospecting phase. And so, and there is no like they say it's six months, but it's not like six months. You're watching the clock wind down. And you're like, hey, I've got four more hours. It's not that way. It, it six months is the general time, and they'll let you know uh, in their own special way <laughs> when when you're when you've made it and when you you know or if you haven't. Right, so you're done when they say you're done, not when you're like, "Hey guys, this is my last day." Yeah, right? yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> nope. And then, um, yeah, then then you're a patched member, and you're you know on probation uh, for a period of time, and then there's officers within the club. And so back to your, your original, there's a treasurer, secretary. There'll be a um, vice president who really doesn't have status unless the president's dead or in jail. Um, Sergeant Arms, which is the number two in a chapter. And also responsible for the weapons, but also the discipline. And then the, the chapter president. And then those chapters report up to uh, what they call a president of presidents, a pop. Um, and that's the level right below Mother Club. And then Mother Club has its own chapter. So the national president, the national vice president, the national sergeant arms are all across uh, Mother Club. And so everybody reports up to that. So Mother Club sounds like what? It's, it's the national chapter instead of the local chapter of the pagans? Exactly. It's the national oversight. And so you'll have each mother club member will have an area. So, um, you know, I was in New York. So the mother club member at the time was Kano and he had um, New York and northern New Jersey. That was his area. So everybody reported up to him and he was part of mother club. Wow. It's like regional management. But it's also like a mafia with the commission and everything, right? Or the, yeah. is that what it's called? The commission? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. And there is a hierarchy. I mean, you know, people think the, these are just, just a bunch of morons running around partying. Uh, yeah. And they're not, they are, they're very sophisticated in how they move their money. They're very sophisticated in their structure. Um, and they're also very sophisticated in what they do. You know, they, they plan operationally. They have undercovers. They have people who they call it Ryan Slipback, no colors, no nothing. People who kind of look like they'd blend in. If they're going to events and stuff, they'll have those people out there planted watching to see if rival gangs are showing, see what the local law enforcement are doing. Um, so they do their, I mean, they're planning maybe not on paper like what it, law enforcement agencies do, but in the end, it's really the same thing. You know, they would brief and, and debrief after, you know, their, you know, events. Wow. Yeah, it's it's surprising because some of these guys are really horrific human beings. And I've got some examples that we can talk about in a little bit here. Early in the book, you talk about simulating using drugs and drinking at a party. And this is something I'd never thought about, right? Okay, you pour out a beer when no one's looking. Maybe you hold a shot in your mouth and then you kind of spit it back into your beer bottle when you're looks like you're chasing the booze so you don't get super drunk. But how do you fake a line of cocaine, right? Like so, that's That sounds like a challenge. Yeah, so people ask that question, and honestly, I, I don't go into it, and I'll tell you why, because it just makes it more difficult for the people behind me, the folks that are going to be Got doing it. this type of work. But yeah. I will I will say this, and it's easier to talk about the alcohol in that sense, is that, um, you know, there'd be plenty of nights that folks would be like, oh my God, you know, we were out, Slam had 10 beers last night. Um, well, the reality is, like, you think about the last time you were in a bar with some buddies, and you know, they were ordering different beers. Did you really see them drink the beer? Did you really watch that liquid cross across their lips? Now, if you're watching somebody drink a beer and you're paying attention to it, you're going to be able to tell whether they drank it or not. But who does that? You know, it, it's not so if you're going to sit there and say, hey, watch me and I'm going to I'm going to fool you into thinking I drank 10 beers, but just stare at me the whole time. You're not going to be able to pull it off. But that's not how it works. And so you um, you do like when it comes to alcohol. Hey, take your beer to the bathroom, dump it out, mo most of it out. And then you go back and you order and you make sure you buy everyone around, you know, so people know, hey, you know, he's back up at the bar again, you know, doing that kind of thing. And, and again, it's just people assume. Um, and there was a time in the book where I talk about where 
it was a test and in a test that I would have failed if I didn't have some dumb luck on my side. And I had plenty of dumb luck throughout this case. Yeah, there was uh, you definitely had some good luck in in this case, which is fortunate. It's probably why you're here to tell the story. Um, I just doing the fake lines of cocaine. It seemed like there were some close calls. And I guess I've I've done all this training and tolerance building just in case I need to go undercover and I didn't need to do it for no reason at all. Could have could have <laughs> just done it. Could have just done fake cocaine. Could have no, just but, faked it the whole time. But, you know, like to your point, like you could sit here and say, hey, I'm not because there is a huge risk to do to faking, you know, using drugs yeah. or the alcohol, whatever it is. Yeah. And, um, and even if on the alcohol, you know, people are going to say, oh, he was drunk the whole time. So when you take the stand, they're going to be like, oh, you were drunk because you had 10 beers. So you're like, you're always going against that. But the reality is, you know, take the flip side. So here's this guy who parachutes in from nowhere. All of a sudden he's hanging around with these guys. Oh, by the way, he doesn't do drugs or alcohol, but he's willing to be a biker. It's like, come on. You know, at some point they're going to be like, really, Mother Teresa now wants to be a biker? Like, how, how does that work? Why not just do, this is probably a dumb question, but why not just do a real line of cocaine, right? It's not like, it's, it's probably not going to kill you right away. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like the risk, of, but the guy, if he finds that you're not doing it in front of him, he could kill you right away. Right. Yeah. And, and listen, there's rules against it. Um, and, and, you know, it, it also would put you on an influence when you know, and these are all things like like everything. Everyone thinks like, oh, you're just hanging out and you're having a good time. There's nothing fun about this. Not one minute of it is fun because it is a constant chess match. You're constantly at risk, but you're also constantly building a case. And everything you do, do during that time is going to be scrutinized later on when it comes time for trial or motions or what have you. And so you constantly have to be on guard against that. And you have to take, you know, get the evidence you can get as far as whether it be recordings, video, audio, copious notes, and be able to, you know, attest to everything that happens during that time. And so if something does happen on a script, now listen, if somebody were to, to put a gun to an undercover's head and said, do this line, I'm going to blow, blow your brains out, the undercover's going to do the line. But then mm -hmm. they're going to come out and they're going to write a report about how they did this line. They're going to go to the hospital because, you know, I know this will come as a shock to you, but somebody may say it's Coke and it's not Coke. It could yeah, be something else. Something. Yeah. Yeah. And there's all sorts of bad things that, I mean, that alone would be a reason not to do because you don't know what the hell they're actually giving you, you yeah. know? Um, so, you know, but having that documentation, you know, in any, anytime you had like, you know, for me, anytime I, you know, was part of any illegal activity, you had to make sure you documented all that because it's coming back. Somebody's going to say, hey, he was there. You know, he saw this person get beaten or whatever it was. And you you better have documented it all. Yeah, you can't be like, oh, man, I was really high on meth. But they made me do it, Your Honor. Yeah, yeah. They made me do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think this is what happened. That doesn't yeah. really play well in court. Right. I was seeing triple, but but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that that was the guy that, 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 that hit yeah. him. And, um, and the, one other addition to that. So, yeah. I mean, we, we've all been drunk at some time in our lives. And that's generally the time you do the stupidest of things. And so if your real life is what it is and then all of a sudden you do this undercover role and you let your guard down and you're, you drink 12 beers, what's the odds that you're not going to say the wrong name or the wrong thing about yourself? Um, it's super high. Uh -huh. Just another reason. It's hard enough to do it when you're sober. Another mind trying to add that into it. Yeah, good point. Yeah, you don't want to start crying about your ex-girlfriend from back in Michigan and they're like, I thought you were from New Jersey, man. What? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And also then you can't really defend yourself because you can't see straight. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you talk about the Devil's Disciples, which is like, I guess, like a minor league support club or, or versus the outlaws who are legit. So what is the difference here? And why would somebody be in one but not the other? You know, why, why be in one club if you're trying to hang out with that pagans all the time? It, it is like AAA baseball. So, I mean, in some ways it is. And that's, you know, when I do some training with law enforcement, I talk about it that way. It's like it's the minor leagues. But really, it, it, you know, I don't mean that to sound negative. What it really is, is that. It's a proving ground to start, number one. Number two, the support clubs are not as regimented as the big five are, um, or the big six, depending on you know, the day. But the, the bigger clubs, there's a lot more to that membership. There's a lot more expected from you. Um, where the, you know, the, the smaller support clubs, it's like, yeah, they're on that. If they're going to a mandatory in support of like the pagans, you know, for example, yeah, you better have your stuff dialed in because bad things can happen to you there and as a support role. But generally, they're treated pretty good because they want numbers. And so when there is an issue, they're going to call that support club and, and, and bring them in. So um, so for some people, that's about as much like they're, they're willing to be a weekend warrior, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and But they don't really want that full time commitment. And and so a lot of them go in there and they stay stay exactly there or their lives change. And they decide, hey, this isn't for me or whatever it is. Uh, but a lot do come up to those ranks. Oh, OK. So yeah, th th that makes sense. You can keep your day job as a. 
I don't know, truck driver or lawyer or doctor, and then you can sort of almost like LARP badass biker dude, and hopefully you don't get shot during a Hell's Angels dust up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You, you said big five or big six. That you're talking about the major biker gangs, right? So what? Hell's Angels, Pagans, uh, Mongols, Outlaws. What? Which other clubs are there? It depends on you know the warlocks, the the vagos. Um, you know, it de- depends on kind of the time. You know, because th- their numbers swell and shrink. Um, but really, the, the 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 biggest and most violent would be those gangs. Warlocks. I've never even heard of them. I guess I have heard of Vato. That, that's a. Uh, is that a let? latin gang so vagos is vagos. people will consider them to be a west coast gang and okay. part of my backstory was that i rode with the vagos i was not a vago but i rode with the vagos now i had done some undercover work against the vagos when i was in la um and so, and it seemed like a safe bet to use that as kind of a you know back and i had done a bunch of research and and i and, you know we had some folks that we knew where their bars were and i went out and it was a part of that so i had my whole backstory intact um, what I never expected was the Vagos to skip the entire country and open a freaking chapter in New York in the middle of our case. Um, but that's like, that was an example of really bad luck. Um, but going back to my point at the beginning where I said, you know, you got to be quick on your toes. Their initial inclination was to talk about me, knowing that I knew people be like, oh, hey, you, you know, in the time I was a prospect, you're like, you know, Ken. And um and so I had said to them when I caught one of this, I was like, hey, listen, man, something's shady about this. Like the Vagos skipped the whole country and decided to open up in New York. Something going on here. I said, let's let's not let them know, you know, who I am. And let me check through my people back in California and check in. And, and they bought that hook, line and sinker, thank God. Um, and so they, they never did tell them. And I would feed them a bunch of BS intel that I was getting out of California. That made sense, but it wasn't true. Um, and they, they were like, hey, this is great. Okay, so to clarify for people who are listening and maybe a little confused, so you your cover story included you were riding with this other gang back on the West Coast that wasn't present on the East Coast. And when you were undercover uh, with the Pagans on the East Coast, suddenly this gang, the real actual gang, wanted to come and start a chapter there, and you were like, shit, they're going to ask about me. I'm get, th- Then the people are going to say, I've never heard of this guy. Then your cover's blown, or at least there's a hole in it. So you made up some some spiel about how they shouldn't say anything because it, it looked shady that they were jumping into York, and thankfully they just decided to keep it quiet because of that. Yeah, and if they don't know that I have connections there, then we could check on them, you know, them unknowingly. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, it worked like a charm, but it was, you know, for, for a minute or two, I was like, oh, man, I'm screwed. You know, yeah, like, oh, my there's God. There's no way this is going to stand up. So pagans and these other clubs are are these big five, big six. These are full time jobs, right? So these are not things where you go, oh, that would be fun to do. Uh, you know, I could probably take Friday afternoons off now that I'm older and I'm established. Micro. This is this is your life, right? This is how you generate revenue. It's how you support your family if you have one. This is your job, right? When you're in a gang like this. So some of these, you know, a lot of them don't have jobs. Um, some of them do have jobs. And, and some of them have, like, there was one uh, guy who worked on Wall Street, and he did a lot of the money laundering, set up the LLCs for the, the funding and stuff like that. Um, he's not the guy you bring into a barroom brawl, um, you know, because he's about five, five feet tall, and he looked like a bowling ball. But the, like, there, there were some that had legitimate jobs. Um, the club priority is the club activity, and so you have to live by that. But there was, I will say that if you had a legitimate job, um, they would work around that for the most part. They weren't looking to get people fired from their jobs and just say, hey, you have to be full time, you know, paying and be here, you know, whatever. Now, if there's a mandatory, you better be there. Um, but mandatories were planned out so you would know. Um, and if, you know, one of your brothers needed you, then you better drop whatever you're doing and get there. Um, so most weren't working in the corporate world, if you will. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, you'd have a lot of mechanics and, you know, uh, folks like that that um, were part of the gang. And, and a lot sense. were unemployed. Yeah. The, the, everything I've learned, like everyone else you've probably talked to about this, everything I know about bikers is, aside from your book, from the show Sons of Anarchy. I got to wonder, did these guys watch that and go, oh, that's not how it is? Or are they obsessed with this show? That wouldn't surprise me. So they they referred to it as the Sons of Malarkey. Uh, okay. and, um, but I will say this. <laughs> uh, it was the ultimate in irony. So I'm a make-believe biker, hanging out with real bikers, watching a show about make-believe bikers. Like you, can't, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. And they would just make fun of the show the whole time. Now, part of their uh, – there was some HA uh, Hells Angels consultants uh, rumored to be you know, uh, on that show. So that just made the pagans hate it even and even more. Um, and so, but yeah, they these guys, uh, and not so much with the Sons of Anarchy, but these guys did their homework. When there was books written, 
they, like they gave me two books right when I, you know, was part of the gang. They said, read these and look for information in there that can help us identify who undercover cops are. Wow. Um, yeah. So they and they would watch all those um, shows on Dis- Discovery and things like that. Um, Gangland and all that stuff. Mm. Looking for tidbits. It's one of the reasons why when I wrote this book, I was in to your question at the beginning about, you know, hey, how do you fake a, a line? Like, I don't give up that stuff um, yeah. in, in the book because there's no purpose. It doesn't change the story, but it does make it, you know, I don't want to make it more difficult on the person who comes behind me. No, I completely understand that. I've had all kinds of people on here before and they're like, hey, that was a little bit of tradecraft that while interesting to you probably shouldn't be because it's going to be very interesting to Al Qaeda or like Iranian special service, secret service. And I'm like, OK, you know, I'll cut it out. It's not. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to. I'd feel pretty bad if somebody got in trouble at at the expense of me entertaining somebody with an anecdote on this podcast, right? Um, yeah. Tell me what the one percenter thing is, because I've I've heard of the patches, I've heard of the one percenter clubs, I've seen that in movies as well. Like, what's the deal? What is a one percenter? So it all comes back from a study that was done by the military back in I think it was the either late fifties or early sixties, and it. You know, everyone was saying, hey, uh, motorcycle enthusiasts, bikers are all bad. So they did this whole study and, and basically out of the study, it came back and said, hey, it, it, listen, 99 percent of them aren't this. You know, one percent of these bikers might be problematic or gang members or what have you, but the rest aren't. So the point of the report was like, don't judge just because they're bikers. Well, then the bikers, the real bikers, the outlaw bikers were like, hey, this is great. We are the one percent. We're proud of being the one percent. And <clears throat> there's only certain clubs that can wear the one percent. Um, patch and if they see somebody you know riding with a one percent patch and they're out from one of the big clubs they will go and rip it off of them or worse um, they're very protective of who can be in the one percent club if you will and a lot of that patch patch structure when generally when you see a three-piece patch on somebody's back then you're then that's going to be one of the bigger five clubs or it could be one of the support clubs but the support clubs won't have one percent on them some of them will have like 0.99%, which is kind of a joke. Um, or, But the support clubs will have something. So like the the, the pagans had, yeah, it would be a P or a 16. Um, and a support club would wear that patch. And so it showed that they were a support club of the pagans. So they kind of flew under the protection of the pagans. There's a lot of sim- symbolism and almost like numerology when it comes to these things. And I noticed that since pagans are also white supremacists, they have that in common, right? Where it's like, this number means this, and this is the 14 words from Adolf Hitler, and this is the number of uh, mother club members or branches of the club, and you got to put this in there, and then this skull has this in the shape of the eyes. They always do that, and it's a, it's a, it's a little culty, kind of. I mean, it is, and it's, and you have some that are much stronger believers in it than others. Like others are kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'm into that, and they're not. And then others are like, hey, this is like the core of what we are. Uh, but you're right. There is a lot of similar. There was one, and I use the term "old lady" because that's how they refer to the females that are either they're married to girlfriends or whatever. It's not my my uh, view. But they, um, one of the old ladies had said, you know, all these guys are, and she was drunk and probably shouldn't have said it, but she was like, hey, all these guys are as evil Boy Scouts, and uh, and that was a tribute back to the patches, like all these patches that they wear. There's not a single patch they're wearing that doesn't mean something. Some of it may be trivial. Um, and then, you know, with my colors, like I was selective of what patches I would put on, um, cause some of them you earn, some of them, it just depends on w- what's happening. Um, but there were some that were given to me, you know, like the SS lightning bolts, some stuff like that. I would, I just, you know, I didn't, I wasn't like, oh no, Hey, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not a believer in that. I just took them and never put them on my colors. Yeah. I'm kind of wondering how you got away with that. You know, like how would, well, how would you even explain that to some like, oh, hey, I just this is an SS neck tat. Don't worry. Daddy's going to cover it up with a butterfly when he's done with this project at work. Well, early, um, not early on, um, after I become patched. So after one year in with the uh, with the pagans, you would get Sutar's sword on your neck. Um, and it's kind of a level like after uh, three years, you can get the word pagans or a small version of the colors. And after seven years, you can have full colors like on your back, you know, tattooed that is. So the chapter president at the time was like, hey, listen, uh, I got permission for you to get Sutar's sword early. Um, and they, they'd broken a bunch of things with me early. Like I became an officer earlier than I was supposed to. Um, there was, I, I, you know, not to jump ahead, but 
I um, I got arrested, and so I should have been pushed out of the club until that case got adjudicated, and we can get into that in a minute. But like, there's all these different you know things that they had rules they broke it for me. So when it came to this, I'm like, hey, man, I go home with Sutar's sword in my neck. This is not going to play well uh, with my wife to start with, and then forget where else. And so I said to him, I said, hey, listen, man, I'm already getting some attitude some, for some folks because you know I've been cutting corners, and you guys have been doing things for me earlier than you know probably should have. You know, let, let's just let this one run out. Let me do my time and um, and you know earn this one. Um, and the chapter president was like, "Hey, man, that's stand up. You know, hundred percent behind you. Um, yeah, let's do that." So it was another, you know, bullet dodged. Yeah, no kidding. That's one of those kind of close calls. And it's funny when I search for Suter's sword. One thing that comes up is the Pagans Motorcycle Club worldwide p- trademark application for their insignia. They yeah. have this trademark. Like, there's an attorney of record on file. They have a registered agent, office, everything. It shows the yeah. patch. Well, well, in one case, in the Mongols' case, they um, they seized the trademark for the Mongols, and it was a battle. It's gone on for years. I don't even know where it stands right now. Where the Mongols had it could not use their colors, and then they got it reversed, and then they could use their colors. This ongoing battle that um, went on. But the Hell's Angels, all that stuff's trademarked. Like they they've all done it. Yeah, that uh, it makes sense when you think about it, but it's just kind of it's kind of funny. Like we're outlaws, but make sure you register that trademark on time and don't let it lapse, right? It's like having a domain name in good standing or something for your meth and money laundering business. And not for nothing, like you don't want to be making up your own pagan shirt and wearing it around town because yeah. you will get called out and you will be beaten severely. I mean, if they found out somebody was wearing a pagan shirt um it, like you're not supposed to have you could wear a shirt that says support 16s and that's what they do for a lot of the supporters they can wear those and they know what that means and people know what that but you cannot have anything that says pagan on it unless you are a pagan even if it's just like a random the word pagan nothing to do with the club they're still going to take offense to that or take issue with that eh I mean, if you, if you were on a baseball team and your last name's Pagan and you had Pagan on your back, like, they're not going to come beat you, out, you know, come out of the stands and beat you for it. But if you're in any reference to, like, what a Pagan would be. So if you had a T-shirt on that says, you know, Pagans are the best, you'd have problems. Uh, wow. You'd have big problems. Interesting. And even as a prospect, as a prospect, you can't touch anything that says Pagans. You can't touch Pagan colors. Nobody's supposed to be touching. Um, and there was an incident uh, in the book that I talked to where somebody actually put their hand on the, on the back of the chapter president, and that created all sorts of problems. Oh, man. Yeah, it's really uh, interesting s- symbolism. And, like, you see the same kind of reverence for the colors as you do for, like, a, like the flag in North Korea, for example. Like it really it has cult languaging and everything. So you're building trust. You're staying at these guys' homes. You're drinking. You're hanging out with them. A- another possibly foolish question but why bother to go undercover and bust these guys right if, if they, are they mostly killing each other if not you know why take the risk no i mean and, if and, so i should say if so why take the risk not if not right no and it's it's a great question because there, there is people out there that believe like hey bikers just kill bikers um and it, it could be further from the truth you know if you um you know and, and, and people have asked me i'm like how would you feel if a clubhouse opened up in your neighborhood um, it's going to change your neighborhood dynamics dramatically, like to the point where you're not even going to be able to live there. Um, they do extort. They sell drugs. Like they affect, just like any other gang, they affect the area that they're in and they recruit from the areas that they're in. And they don't just, like I was, you know, when I was in the club, they would extort protection money from whether it would be bars or different establishments, depending on what chapter and where you were. Um, and so they, they're a criminal organization, just like anything else. And, and the reason why to go undercover is the only you can from the outside to, you know, maybe some prospects or some hangarounds, you'd be able to deal with, you know, maybe some low level members um, and maybe you can build a case on them. You're never getting anywhere near the leadership of the game because they just they're insulated. The only way to do that is to go undercover in the club and go up into the ranks and for me, out of the two years, it probably took the first year and a half just to get to the level where I was dealing with mother club members and, and the, the likes. Wow. Wow. It, the way you describe these guys, they're all absolutely enormous. It's always like this guy was six foot five, 345 pounds. Is that normal or are these just the absolute monsters that you came across that were noteworthy? Like, is there anybody where you're like, yeah, he was five, nine on a good day, depending on how thick the soles of his shoes were. Former <laughs> lawyer. Now he's got a podcast, probably get his ass beat with two punches in a bar fight. <laughs> or, or is that not exactly the phenotype of what outlaw biker gangs are looking for? 
I'll be honest. There were some little cats in there too, and, okay. and some scrappy ones. But the chapter I was in had some very large humans, and uh -huh. uh, and I'm not talking like weightlifters, fit marathon runners, or anything like that. These were some big humans, had a lot of weight, but also, you know, for some of them, were very tall. Um, and so, yeah, they were. When when we walked into the bars and and into businesses, in some cases, like into restaurants. Um, the presence, I mean, anybody wearing the collars is going to get, you know, some sort of recognition, but it, these are some large humans. And, and so people would stop and gasp and be very focused on, and, and quite honestly, we feared them, you know, and you could see that when you walk into these areas or there would be this sick attraction. Like I could never say like we, we'd be in bars and, and, um, you'd have guys who'd be coming up and like buying you beers and doing all this stuff. Like you were, you know, a, a sports star or a rock star. And then you'd have women and some beautiful women who'd be hitting on some of these guys. And some of these are the ugliest humans I've ever seen in my life. And they would regularly have, you know, some beautiful women who were very interested to be with them. And, and I could never, I could never figure out why. Yeah. It's a, uh, that whole bad boy thing turned up to 11. Uh, it seems yeah. like a little bit, it's a little bit too dangerous. I think it's, it's not, uh, I, I assume these women don't know what they're getting into a lot of the time. With you it. gotta figure they have at least some idea. I mean, it's yeah. not like you're hiding it. They're wearing colors. They're in packs. Um, you know, they. Um, you know, it's probably not a safe bet. You know, um, hanging out with the, this group of folks, but there was definitely that attraction. And uh, and I'm not saying everyone by any stretch of imagination, but there were times like I'd be like, you gotta be kidding me. How could she be interested in him? Um, and and some of it, I think, was just the, like you said, the bad boy image. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That's. <laughs> yeah, it's it's bizarre. But also, I guess, look, power. If people are afraid of somebody and this person has that pattern in their past, I mean, that's a whole that's a whole psychological episode of this podcast, I suppose. Uh, the pressure just seems enormous. You're no stranger to, to action and pressure. Tell me about that shootout you got involved in earlier in your career. That was kind of like, it seems like you got a taste right from the jump. Yeah, it was, you know, it was um, supposed to be kind of a routine activity. And I was in between academies. And so at the time, I mean, they still have two different academies. You have a basic academy and then like the advanced specialized, like geared towards your specific agency. Um, and so at the time you would go to the first one, which would be about 12 to 16 weeks. And then you'd have a gap of maybe two, three weeks. And then you go back down for another 12, 16 weeks. So um, in that gap, uh, when I was back in LA, we were going and we were executing an, an arrest warrant. Uh, so it was going to be kind of like a buy bust uh, for a couple kilos of coke. And then um, we were doing a search warrant on the apartment that was above where the buy bust was going to take place. And so the buy bust was going to be in a parking garage, LA style, you know, it's underneath and you could yeah. see into them, but they're gated and, and what have you. So um, we, uh, so I was on the uh, team going in to secure the apartment and do the search warrant. But um, as we approached, it was, um, Right out of the get go, the shots are fired, and um, and so we had an agent go down uh, who shot in the foot, and um, and one of the one of the bad guys was standing. Uh, so the garage ends up closing. So those who were inside were inside, and those who were outside were outside. And you were not going to get through the other way. So, so you're so was, trapped in a parking structure that's locked with guys shooting at you, and and you shooting at them. Essentially. Yeah, yeah. So they had, Jesus. yeah, and they had, you know, Tech Nines. They had, they had some pretty good weaponry, but. Um, <laughs> One of them I, was standing behind a pillar, and there's rounds flying everywhere. There's hundreds of rounds that were fired, and, and um, he never gets hit, which is amazing. <laughs> the other one had multiple. It was like, I forget the, the exact count, but it was like 32 entry and 26 exit wounds. Like he had been shot, but the way he was shot and he was strung out on coke, um, he lived. Um, you know, he, he lived? Yeah, Unbelievable. He, lived. Um, he was crossed behind a car. The only thing that stopped it was his magazine. Uh, he had an extended clip, and uh, the magazine got shot, and all the rounds fell out. Um, and so that's really what ended at that. And an agent had come in, uh, or an agent that was in there had a, a shotgun with a slug and it, it basically blew his arm off and that shut it down. But it was, and then we still had to go up and, and clear the apartment because we thought there was two more individuals up there. So we go to do that and then it gets locked down and, and it happened to be only about three blocks from where I lived, but it got locked down and we were there all night. It got a, a bunch of coverage. And so then it's like, you're trying to notify family members. And so anyways, long story short, they were like, hey, it's too stressful. We're not going to send you back to the academy. So I ended up being on the job for almost two years before I fully got through the academy. Um, but one of the things they had done is because, um, 
you know, they, they um, had some undercover opportunities. And so they, they, they gave me a memo that said, hey, before you even go to the second academy, we're going to let you do some undercover work. And so I started doing undercover work before I even had finished doing the academy. And, um, wow. But back in those days, LA, LA was different. Uh, in the sense that, you know, there were a whole lot of brand new agents. There were not a lot of senior agents. They were all trying to get out. It's too expensive, too dangerous. And so as a, a new agent, you got to do a lot of things that you weren't able to do in other areas in the country just because physically there was nobody else to do it. Um, so you're given a lot of latitude. So it really helped you it, it, learn the job faster than, you know, somebody who might have been in, say, Boston. Yeah, although being short staffed and under experienced is probably not a good like it's not exactly the best way to further your career, I suppose, or the safest way. Yeah, plenty, plenty of ways that you could uh, make mistakes or, or worse. So, yeah, um, but yeah, but no, I, I va really valued my time in L.A. I, I learned a lot by being out there. Your parents must have been thrilled, right? You go to school, you get an accounting degree, and then you come out and you're getting shot at by drug dealers right like on the th you know, first first year in or first few months in. It's like, what'd you do today? Oh, man, we, this guy got shot 27 times, 32 no, they, times. They, I'll tell you, they were, um, you know, again, I, as you just said, I went to school for accounting. My, my dad was a CPA, my brother was a CPA, so they were like, oh, he'll be a CPA. And, and uh <laughs> I was like, it's just not in my DNA uh, to do, you know, that, sit behind a desk for 25 years or whatever it is. And I applaud yeah. those who do, but it just wasn't for me. And my mom had, you know, a couple of big things. She hated, hated motorcycles, hated tattoos, hated guns. And so I was, you know, pretty much like the giant disappointment, um, you know, because I, I had done, had done them all. But and, and really, they were just concerned about my safety. I think they, they knew how much I liked the job and, and uh, how much I put into doing the job. And they just wanted me to stay in one piece. Sure. Yeah. No, understandable. They, I, it's hard to – you're doing all this exciting stuff. It's hard for them to be like, have you tried spreadsheets? Those are fun too. <laughs> <laughs> well, they weren't, they weren't digging when I was – particularly in this case because I, I just looked like a dirtbag. Yeah. And so you're going to family events and even for my kids and stuff, it, it, it's hard to explain, you know, your shit bag, the son, you know, and what, what, why does he look the way he, he does? But, um, yeah, they, they got through it. Yeah, you're, this is my son, the deadbeat. Oh, no, he's going to make something of himself. Like, oh, man, they must be so disappointed in him. Yeah, oh, man. It sounds a little bit like my career, except replace accounting degree with law degree and replace taking down international drug rings with uh, doing a podcast in your underwear. <laughs> so a, a lot of these guys, they seem mentally ill, the bikers, right? One of the least disgusting examples, aside from the violence, is the guy who found, like, freshly born kittens and licked the blood off of them. And he did so many worse things in the book, but I'm afraid if I describe them here, people will literally, if they're eating right now, they're going to, they're going to at least stop eating, if not worse. Because some of the examples are just like, I can't get them out of my head. They're so disgusting. And that's not even the crimes. This is just the weird personal yeah. habits of some of these dirt bags. And yeah, and, and you know, it's funny, one of, one of the folks that I knew who read the book, you know, their advice was don't read it while you're eating for, for that reason. And, and within your stories that tie back to Hogman, there's worse than that, um, that I didn't, I chose not to put in there. Um, and so he, you know, was a, he had a blood fetish, he was a vile human being. Um, and in it, it, like, even when you have, in, in to your point, you know, we don't have to cover them all here, but when you have a chapter president, react in a very negative way and throw him out of the hospital that we were in when he had done something it's like you've crossed a lot you've really gone above and beyond if you can get a pagan to actually feel that that was disgusting um so yeah he was he was at a different level but you know these guys um you know people always ask about like oh what, what was the makeup and and the makeup was really different. just like society just like any group of people you know you'd have some folks that were narcissists you had some folks that were you know, just looking for a belonging. You other people just straight out criminals. Um, you mm -hmm. other people are just like, hey, I like this. I like to intimidate. I like to bully people. You know, um, and maybe by themselves they couldn't do it, but in a pack they could. Um, so there was a there was no really hidden formula. Like people are like, oh, there's uh, a lot of military during biker gangs. Well, that's not what I saw. I mean, there were some military members, but no, not huge amount. I mean, there's there's a lot of different bike organizations out there. And going back to what we we're talking about the one percent the vast majority of them are just in bike clubs. Um, and, and listen, law enforcement has bike clubs, you know, much to my chagrin when I do presentations, you know, I ask anybody in here, part of law enforcement, any part of a, um, you know, a, a club. And if you have a structure in there, like a Sergeant arms and a president of those things, and I'm like, you know what, you're in the wrong profession because why do you need a Sergeant arms? What does a Sergeant arms do? You know? And so 
some some of the but there's there's like really no rhyme or reason of, of who who belongs to it and who's successful at it. Hey, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There's a lot more just like this. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. You've got to really work to create this sort of undercover life and character, right? Because I assume you need to have like a fake high school diploma or bills laying around or fake junk mail that's addressed to your fake name, right? That's, there's got to be an office that helps with that, I assume, at ATF. Right. Yeah. And this and it's one of those things that you do over the course of your career. You have one or maybe more undercover identities that you're building over time. And and yeah, you do like they do an extensive background. I had to fill out a bunch of forms, a, a, a very long background. Um, they were supposed to polygraph, uh, which they ultimately ended up not doing. Uh, but in, but they have and other clubs do. So you have to have all these things lined up and then. Like, you know, so my criminal history, you know, so I was a convicted felon um, in my undercover world. And, um, you know, my felony was for kicking the shit out of a cop, which was not a good choice that I later learned to uh, or lived to regret. But it, all of a sudden I get arrested and and now all that comes into play. So you have all these different levels of backstopping, if you will. And you never know if it's going to come into play. And but you better have it squared away. Because when something happens in that, so like when I got arrested, they're going to pull those prior convictions and they, there better be prior convictions. There better be police reports when they order them and all those kind of things, or that's the end of it. Cause the attorney that was representing me was a pagan attorney given to me by the pagans. So you don't think they're going to make a quick call and say, Hey, by the way, this guy, you know, I know you told you he's a convicted felon. There's no felony conviction. He never was convicted. Matter of mm. fact, that, that name doesn't even exist. So um, there is a lot that goes into it and a lot that, you know, uh, um, I, I don't spend a lot of time talking about because I don't want to give up something. Like but just simple things like it's just more common sense. But like you get all this junk mail at your house. Well, you get it because you belong to all sorts of different things. You do different things. But when you don't do anything because you don't exist, you don't get junk mail. So like how do you right. get junk mail? And so you actually have to put in an effort to go out and get yourself on these mailing lists that you wish you could get your real life off of. <laughs> but you have to do that so you can have this stuff because when they come to your house in your apartment, you better have that stuff there. It can't be this sterile environment. Yeah, you need like a like a birthday card from a used car dealership that's like, come in, in and look for your new ride. Yeah, that, that's yeah. annoying as crap, like car warranty spam. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, and you better have a story about like what's your family, who 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 are your family, where are they? Because it, it, they did you know background checks and they went and did surveillance on where I said I work. They did a lot of their homework on me. And so if you say, hey, your dad lives at 123 Main Street, they're going to go by to see if your dad's there. Now, they may not knock on the door. They may just sit there and watch, see if he comes out. What, who knows what they're going to do? But you better have your stuff squared away. What's really cringe, that I, I remember reading in the book, that this is really cringe. They Y'all kiss each other on the lips as a greeting. Like, what the heck is that about? That's so gross. <laughs> it's a, uh, it is a accepted biker yeah, you know, they all do it. And um, and some, you know, it, it, it's, it's most will kiss on the lips. Some will kiss on the cheek. It, it's it, it's kind of hard to explain, but it is what it is. But there's other there's some that like Hogman, the dude had a blood fetish. Like who wants to be kissing that guy? Yeah, that's, what, that's uh, why it's gross. I don't care about the dudes kissing each other on the lips. That's the least gross part. The part that's gross is these guys probably have hepatitis for the last yeah. 20 years from sharing and needles a lot of them, and stuff. And a lot of them did. And it openly would tell you, I have hepatitis. And they'd be like, hey, by the way, you want to try my pasta? And it's like, no, nah, I'm pretty, pretty sure I'm all set, man. Thanks. Yeah. Um, but there's, and that's why, you know, um, you know, I had a, a wonderful personal doctor who, you know, every opportunity was testing me for everything under the sun because yeah. you just never knew, um, you know, what you were being exposed to. Yeah. I have to clarify that. I don't want people to think that it, it's a homophobic thing. That's far from it. It's mostly that these guys are, I mean, th the guy you talked about before who licked the blood off the kittens. When you read the book, you'll understand why you wouldn't want to kiss a guy like that on the lips besides the kitten thing. There's a, that was like the, the G rated version compared to the stuff that, that was in the book. And you said there was stuff that didn't even make it. And yeah, he's not the only gross one in the pack. That's for damn sure. Um, yeah. and, and they would joke amongst themselves. They yeah. would joke, you know, there was one guy named um, Wiz. It, dude had lizard breath and it was like nobody wanted to, you know every time he's coming they're like oh god here comes whiz like so they would joke amongst themselves about who you know it's still part of the culture you had to do it but nobody enjoyed it you uh, know god how, how do undercovers get permission to do 
illegal things. I, I had a guy on the show named Joe Barone. He was a mafia gangster turned FBI informant. And I, he, so, he showed me a lot of his court documents and the FBI mm-hmm. clearing him for doing illegal activity. But it, it was pretty vague. You know, it was like maybe involved in money laundering and other racketeering gambling activities. And I was like, man, that's a wide berth, you know, yeah. of illegal stuff. But there's no way to script it, right? You don't know, you know, like I was saying earlier, like I didn't know how my day was going to turn on any day and you don't know what criminal activity. Now, there was never going to be a day that I was going to go out and be part of a murder or anything like that. You're not authorized to do it, nor would I do it even if I was. But, you know, when it came to narcotics trafficking or weapons trafficking and um, then, yeah, those things could happen and did happen and that you uh, had to have the authorization. So it's, you know, um, your agency, along with the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, and they basically sign a memorandum saying that you're authorized to participate in these you know, tier one, tier two activities, blah, blah, blah. And it's all part of it's all part of when you're starting the case up and you get those things in order uh, ahead of time. You did all this when you had kids. Your your wife must have just loved that. I mean, that's uh, that's so stressful already. But when you have kids and you're married, it's just 10x. Yeah, it, like I could tell you, people are always like, oh, I can't believe your you know, marriage survived. And I'm like, well, listen, the first thing I'll tell you, if you're ever looking for like how to strengthen your marriage, going undercover for two years is not going to be on that list of things to do. Um, but, you know, my wife was an agent. And so that's great. She understood what it was, but it was also horrible because she understood what it was. And so, you know, she was, you know, right, you can't confident. lie to her and be like, no, 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 I'm, I'm safe the whole time. They're right next to me. I'm wearing a wire. She's like, that's bullshit. And I know it. She could go in and pull up the report. She had access to the system. Ah, she could see every worse. single thing. So, that's yeah, there's, there's, there's absolutely no BS in her as to uh, as to what it was. But, yeah, and then she had the burden, you know, our, our, our girls were teenagers at the time. And, um, you know, that's just a tough age to start with. And so she's she's dealing with that. She had her own job. And then she's got... You know, she's getting phone calls in the middle of the night that, you know, um, you know, can't get arrested or wh- whatever was happening in that time, um, because the case agent would try to keep her as uh, up to date as he could on, on to what my activities were. So, um, yeah, not a uh, it was a very tough time uh, for, really for the whole family. And, and a lot of a lot of stuff with the kids was kept for me at the time because my wife wanted me to focus on what I was doing. And you learn a lot about it after or later. Um, and and even to this day, like they don't. They now know, a, have a really good view of the case, but they didn't know a lot of what had happened. And then, you know, they read the book and they're, they're a big part of why I wrote the book. I had no intention of writing a book. Uh, my wife and my daughters were like, you need to memorialize this because you'll mm-hmm. be gone someday. And and the story needs to be told. And so that's what, you know, made me do it. Yeah, I loved it. I plowed through the book in two days. I mean, I'm a fast reader, but two days is that's fast for a book well, of this size. That's good. That means yeah. it had to, I wanted it to be an easy read. I wanted it to be, you know, an ability for somebody to come in and take a look inside my world during that time to just mm-hmm. get really kind of get a feel for it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So your wife was an undercover as well. What was she, what type of work was she doing? So it goes back to your original question about, Hey, do you have to do undercover? And so my wife, Hispanic female. Um, and so she was kind of like, Hey, we need you to do this. And so she was working in New York. And so, um, she, they would ask her to go in and buy drugs uh, more, more drugs, sometimes guns, um, in the projects in New York. And, um, you know, which is not, you know, first of all, there's no cover team. Some of those projects go up 30, 40 floors. Uh, there's no cover team ever going to get to you. Um, and, and being a female, that brings up a whole lot of other yeah. concerns and risks. So um, she was very good at it, um, but she didn't like it. And when we were early dating uh, and I was in California, and I had the better end of the deal only because she'd be doing on it. We'd both be doing undercover at the same time or at, in the same day. And so for her, she'd be, you know, doing a drug buy at 11 o'clock at night. Well, that's eight o'clock for me. Mm. And we would, we would notify each other when, when we were safe. But for me, I'm, if I'm doing it at midnight, it's three o'clock in the morning for her. So she lost a lot of sleep over those, that time because, um, you know, she wouldn't, you know, hear from me and I was involved in the shooting in one of the undercover deals that I had done. And she didn't hear from me for like a day. Um, so there was a lot of stress that went with that, but she, uh, she was really good at it. But when she, when we got married and she came out to LA, she's like, you know, I really just don't like this. I don't like doing it. I'm like, then don't do it. And I said, here's a clean break. You come in a new division just so that the ASAC at the time, who's, who's a really good guy, um, said, oh, I can't wait to get you going undercover. I heard all this That's stuff. That's the special in agent in charge, right? So he's like the, the boss. So the assistant special agent charge. Yeah. So he's like, there's two of those below the special agent. Oh, you charge. said ASAC. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. ASAC. So he, um, and he was like, Hey, can't wait to get you involved in undercover workout here. You'll be a great fit. And so she told him, she's like, yeah, I'm not 
doing undercover work anymore. Um, and he was like, what? What are you talking about? And I, I was like, hey, this is a perfect opportunity. So she focused her career more on arson explosives. Uh, arson which is more and explosives. A, wow. Yeah, that was her thing. And more of a whodunit, like something blows up and you figure out who did it, where mine was more like, okay, here's the people who are doing it, build the box around them type of thing. Did she work on that case where it turned out to be a firefighter the whole time, burning no. buildings down for like 20 years? Actually, that was me. That was um, you. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, my degree is in accounting. So when I first started on the job, they put me in an arson group because a lot of arson work is based on uh, money. Insurance fraud, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, um, yeah, so I, I, I was a brand new agent and kind of um, myself and Glenn Lucera, uh, L.A. Fire Department arson investigator, um, started that case. And we initiated that case and, and worked it through. I was going back and forth to the academy, so others were involved in it as well. But, yeah, that guy was one sick individual. Yeah, you, you think of arsonists as weird solo crazies because you got to love burning something down that might hurt a lot of people, does a lot, it does damage to people's stuff, ruins people's lives. Like there's no, it's, there's almost no kind of real obvious upside for it. If you own the building, man, yeah, you do some insurance fraud, you get it. But if you're just burning down someone else's building, it's just, there's, it's pure crazy. There's, there's a, um, for most of them, it ties back to like a, a sexual, um, deal it's it, yeah, yeah, it's, it's more it, yeah there's a lot yeah there's a lot of studies to it but this particular individual he was one of the most probably the most prominent in california arson investigators and because he wasn't just a firefighter he was an arson investigator and oh, i wow. worked scenes with him um and he's probably one of the top five in the country and um and so he was he was starting these fires and of course we'd go out and work scenes and work grids to look for devices and he was always the guy who found it so in retrospect you're like oh i wonder why now i know yeah. look um, it was under this chair the whole time how did you find that well definitely yeah if you put it there right but i mean he was responsible for the deaths of uh, more than one individual you know through these fires and some Terrible. you know horrible yeah grandparent uh, a grandmother and her, her um, granddaughter both were killed so Ugh. yeah he's he's right where he needs to be that's, yeah, it's horrible. How, how do you manage the undercover work you were doing with kids? Because on the one hand, you almost get blown up with a huge explosion when this this bomb maker in the book, right? But how do you tell your kids, uh, hey, I'm not going to be around for a while, but also I can't tell you what I'm doing, especially when they're teenagers. Like, they got they kind of know, and the, but then you got to have rules, right, for explaining this sort of thing. You can't be kind of hot and cold with it or it won't work. We, we always tried our best to keep a low profile with our neighbors about what we did. Not to say that some didn't know. I mean, you, you're walking out of your house at four o'clock in the morning because you're going to do warrants. People are going to figure things out. But we, we kept a very low profile when it came to that. And we also had raised our kids like, don't talk about what mom and dad do. Um, and, and if any conversation you hear, you know, keep it here because uh, they're sensitive. And, and they were pretty good about it. But this was a little bit different. Um, this was like, hey, dad's gone. When he comes home, you know, like my wife would be the first one to tell you, when you came home, you weren't really home, you know, and in, in retrospect, thinking back, how could I possibly have been home? Because it, sometimes it was more stressful being away from the gang because you didn't know what was happening and then you had to re-engage with them. Where mm -hmm. It was easier when you were just with them day in and day out and you could see how things would develop. Um, and then they would hear, unbeknownst to my wife and I, they would hear conversations that we would have as kids do. You know, you think they're asleep or they're, in, you know, whatever. And, um, and that came out when I, I, I was able to, to get home and I, I went to one of my daughters, my youngest daughter's hockey games. And I saw, and I was supposed to be the head coach of the team, but you know, that was before I had agreed to do this case. And so, um, I was uh, over by the bench and one of the girls had said, um, Hey, you know, coach Ken, we, ha we haven't seen you in a while. I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. I've been working. And she's like, Oh yeah, we, we heard you were at a party with Roblox. Oh, and God. I was like, holy shit. Like this, this is a big deal. Like. You don't know if that name gets out and gets, you know, somebody posts something or whatever it is that your whole identity is gone. Um, and so like simple things like that. And, and um, so, you know, we talked to the kids and my wife and I were also like, hey, we got to we, we got to go to the garage when we talk. We just cannot talk about this in here because they're hearing us. Thanks. So you must have had to have a like a parent, like a baseball or whatever soccer meeting like, hey, you can't tell your kids about this. I know you know some stuff and you hear some stuff like this will get me killed or worse. Right. Like, well, did you have to manage that somehow? Well, the, the, the folks that like, I'm sure they speculated um, the parents of players or whatever, but we never I never told them anything. You know, um, now they could see I look like a shit bag. And when I was at games, you could see parents from like the other team looking at like, who's the shit bag, you know, over there watching the game. But, <laughs> you know, it's and it used to infuriate my wife because my wife would be like, I just want to scream out. He's a federal agent because and he's keeping go to the you supermarket. safe. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and she's like, we go in the supermarket and, and people look at you like you're a dirt bag. And, and at one point I was in a bank. Actually, I wasn't even in the bank. I was in the bank and came out and I, I took a phone call standing out front. I got jacked up and thrown in the back of a cruiser just because in, 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 I later learned there was a guy who did an armed robbery and he was like five foot one. I'm like six three. Like he didn't look anything <laughs> like me, but I still ended up getting jacked up and thrown in the, in the, in the yeah. cruiser. So, um, you know, stuff happens and, and you know, you, you know, you, you just kind of reflect back. You're like, why am I doing this again? Yeah, no, that would, uh, you would second guess it. I mean, the undercover life has to spill into your home life a little bit, even in addition to that. Like, I would imagine you you can't be with a bunch of guys talking about violence, drugs, misogynist stuff, and, and disgusting activity, and then come home and, and be a model citizen at home. I, I assume the language, at least, the foul language, is at the least of that has to spill over into your home life. And then you're just like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I can't do oh, my, that in front of my kids. No, my wife would say to me, she's like, hey, you, we can't lose you to the dark side. Like you're like, it, so we were talking one night and I was describing somebody and, um, and I'll just say the name, you know, John. She's like, well, who's John? Cause she didn't, you know, like anything, if I'm telling you the story, you're like, wait a minute, who's who? And so I'm like, you know, the, the dude who uh, puts peanut butter on his balls and his dog licks him off. And, <laughs> and she's like, she's like, do you realize what you just said? She goes, you say that like you're describing someone with blonde hair. Like you, that was your description. You didn't even bat an eye. Like you didn't even think that was weird. She's like, you cannot turn into one of them. And I'm like, I'm not. She said, that's the, the thing that pops in my head when I think of this idiot. Uh, so she, that concerned her. And she, she always like was there to try to level set and be like, Hey, remember, keep a foot in reality. Right. Um, and, and, you know, obviously I did and, and it all worked out, but yeah, the, the, you know, to your point, it does, it does give you a different view for sure. When you say get lost to the dark side, does that just mean it degrades the way you talk and act as a person? Or are there agents that are like, you know what, this criminal life, I'm making a lot of money, screw this police thing, this is great. I mean, does that ever happen? I don't ever think it's for the money, um, but I, I think maybe the lifestyle. So um, there's, it, it, we've lost people to the dark side. And um, like so they like quit when I, law enforcement, is that what that means? Not so much, no, but they, they will make, um, they, they change and their personality changes. Ultimately, they're not able to survive on the job anymore mm. um, because of choices that they make afterwards. And so um, ATF made a real concerted effort to really monitor that. So like when I was in, I had to every six months go see a shrink. To, and so they level set before you go in and then every six months you get evaluated. Now it's, it's problematic because you got to come up with an excuse to disappear. Um, and so I, but I, you go and, and they would evaluate you and, you know, I assume if they saw something wrong, they'd be like, hey, you got to pull them out. Um, now, I always joked. I'm like, OK, if I can fool 2000 pagans, I'm pretty sure I could fool one shrink. Uh, but my shrink friends say, no, they're smarter than that and they'd be able to detect it. So I, I don't know the real truth. I didn't go to the dark side, so I don't, I don't know. But they do put a lot of effort into making sure that those who are doing this stay healthy and, and stay entrenched in where they're at and and. Can, you know, when they come back out, they give you a transition period to get back, you know, into a normal life again. I know you said that there's cover teams nearby where possible. Obviously not when you're in the top of a, a 40 story building in the projects or whatever, if you can't do that. But a lot of this biker stuff, man, you're out in the middle of what sounds like just like a in the middle of the desert in a campground at best or in the woods somewhere. I mean, you can't just have. A, a police van with tinted windows parked on the side of the road anywhere near this thing, right? No, no, you can't. And, and so other than one exception in the entire two years, I never wore a wire because there were times, so churches where they do all their secretive meetings and where they do their you know criminal planning and, and things like that. So they refer to it as church. Um, when you go to church, and this is because they learned over the years on criminal prosecutions, that there's ways through cell phones that you can monitor cell phone batteries, blah, blah, blah. So there were no electronics allowed in church at all. And in some cases, uh, most cases, they were they had RF detectors, so RF picking up a frequency of a transmitter. They would wand you to make sure that you didn't have any transmitters on. And there were times where we had to strip naked and we'd be sitting, these are some ugly people, man, and I'm just sitting in you know church naked, um, you know, having our meetings so that they knew nobody could have had a wire on. So, wow. Um, and, and so even if a cover team was around the corner, 
they're not going to know anything happens until way in. Maybe they see your body getting dragged out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so it, it um, but in most cases, they were way too far away anyways. I mean, there's times, miles, miles away. So they always joked it was the body recovery team, not really yeah. a, a, a cover team. Um, but there's these cover teams, if they get too aggressive and they're too close, they can actually burn, um, burn you much more than you can burn yourself. Um, and so you have to have trust in those folks that are out there and they know, and I'd much rather, I'd rather work my way out of something than have somebody come gang busting through you thinking they're helping me when they're not. Did your cover team ever get you in trouble or come close to it? There was only, in, in it's pretty amazing for a two-year investigation, um, and, and I will caveat this. So when you were at certain events, like if I went to a mandatory, which the mandatory is a prospect, worst experience, and we could talk about that, but there was a law enforcement there, All everyone was there, and, and they knew law enforcement was there, and so they'd be flipping them off, posing for photographs, because they knew the cops were all watching it, because it was known that these events were happening. So like, anybody could be there, there's no problem. Um, but there was a, a, a night when I was uh, buying um, an, a couple ounces of crack cocaine off a of hogman and his- As one uh, does, yeah. Yeah, you know, just a regular Friday night. Um, and his source came and delivered the crack cocaine. And uh, so paid him, did, you know, our thing, we were done. Um, and a, a not so bright uh, supervisor was in a Crown Vic and got way too close. The, the uh, classic the, police car that every kid recognizes yeah. from age 15 through the yeah. rest of your life. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're in that, just go to like the local coffee shop and have a coffee because you're not going to help anyways. But anyways, this this clown got way too close. Um, and this this guy calls back to it was Hogman who I was buying the crack from. He calls back and he goes, hey, um, cops are all over me. You know, something's up, your place heated this up, you know, what's going on over there, blah, blah, blah. And so Hogman's saying this to me, and I'm like, hey, fuck this guy. He's clearly got the cops on him. He brought him to him. Tell him he better not bring his ass back anywhere near here. Just tell him to keep freaking driving or they jack him up, better keep his mouth shut. And so just put it back on him. Um, and we, we had several transactions where we didn't need to deal with him again. Uh, but when I met the the cover team um, later, yeah, you know, I met him at like three in the morning to give him the crack cocaine. Uh, I let in, you know, like, hey, who was that? Who was in that car? They should never be out here again. Um, and unfortunately, it was the supervisor, so they kind of <laughs> they kind of had to be out there. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's oh man, it's it sucks because it's it's the classic boss maybe doesn't really know the, the what the guy on the ground is dealing with except for in, instead of like oh you messed up a week of work it's like oh you got three people killed or you got me murdered in front of my co colleagues and ruined or just ruined the whole case where i was undercover for years with these guys right yeah no that's exactly it the amount of time blood sweat and tears that go into this and listen there's things that happen over the, that's why people are always like oh you know, what, whatever made you decide to do a two-year undercover? Well, you don't go into it knowing it's two years. It could be two minutes. You know, I listen, I didn't sign up for a two-year undercover deal. That's just what it turned into. And um, most of the, or a lot of these, as they're progressing along, get stopped for different reasons. One, something's going to happen where you have to come out of roll and stop it. Number two, your cover does get blown. It happens regularly. Um, like, there's so many things that can happen that would stop it. The fact that very few of these run for two years. Um, and so, you know, you, you're always kind of just seeing how it's going to play out. And and that's where, you know, some of this um, dumb luck comes into it. And people always think I'm making light of it, but it is a fact. Yeah, I've heard, I've had other undercovers on before. Jack Garcia, who infiltrated the mob, he was with the FBI. And he basically just abruptly had to stop because one of the guys he was with just saw somebody he hated at the mall and picked up like a glass centerpiece and hit him in the head with it. And he's like, well, if he hits him again, that guy's going to die. And I'm standing right here and we're at a shopping mall. And so he was like, what are you doing? And he like, basically, I think I can't remember the exact details, but I want to say he stopped the guy or he arrested the guy right there and was like, got to pull the ripcord because this idiot is an impulsive dumbass and i'm i can't let this guy get beat to death it, another criminal actually and you know it's unfortunate like you can't let this guy get beat to death in front of me because laws yeah and uh yeah no there it was in the same, and there was a couple times there was one night that uh i was a sergeant at arms and i and there was another sergeant at arms and two presidents and we were heading over to see a president of a support club and um, it, it got heated um we were going back and in they the two presidents were like we're gonna kill him um, we're going to stab him. And we were up on the rooftop of a, um, a motel. 
And they wanted to toss him between these two buildings. It was like a three foot gap. And they're like, we're going to stab him and throw him between these two buildings. And so it's like 700 of their gang members in this hotel. And I'm like, How? there's no way that I can let this happen for sure. And I've got a gun with six rounds in it. So that's not you know going to do me a whole <laughs> lot of good. Right. And so I'm looking around and on the rooftop and I see some blue flashing lights way off in the distance. And I'm like, how do I get their attention? Anyways. Long story short was um, I was able to use their own rules back on them. You know, to kill a, a president of another club, you've got to have Mother Club to, to bless off on that. And I'm like, hey, we got to go back and get Mother Club. We were at a mandatory. So I was like, we got to go back and get Mother Club to bless off on this. And one of the one of the presidents was like, fuck that, we're doing it anyways. The other president was like, yeah, he's right. Let's go. We'll go. And by the time we went, got there, everyone kind of cooled off, talking to Mother Club. And they're like, no, there's other ways we could handle it. So bottom line is we were able to... to Avoid it, but like at that point, I there was no choice. I was going to have to come out of roll. Oh man, I'm mean, good thing you are such a good student and you memorized all these little bylaws <laughs> that they have, right? You had to pull. You, you could have been a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, subsection four says we have to get sign off on this. Ah, you're right. He's right. Yeah. yeah the, man, use their own stuff back against them. I know eventually they put a female agent in as your girlfriend, which seems like a good idea because then at least you're not alone, right? So uh, maybe if they got a female agent coming in as your girlfriend, she's just like another set of eyes. What what other benefit is there uh, aside from that? So so there's, you know, in a lot of these cases, they they would do that. It, where you'd cycle somebody in and out as a girlfriend. Um, in this particular case, there was a couple things. One is you've got a lot of these women who, like, not not the un undercover, but other, a lot of other women involved in the case, um, like old ladies or hangarounds or what have you, and they're going to be hitting on you all the time. And so, like at some point, you know, if you don't have a girlfriend or uh, a, a wife or something out there, like you're only going to be able to say no so many times before it's going to start looking weird. It kind of goes back to like the you know, here's the new guy in. Oh, he he's not interested in women. He's not doing drugs. He's not doing um, you know alcohol and all. Of a so it just doesn't look right. Um, and so when you could have a female as part of that, that would take that burden away. The problem is on a female, and there's and I talk about it in the book is, you, you know, you could go alone. You can go and have a female who's you know there, but they can't be there for a lot of the stuff. But especially when you're prospecting, they don't want girlfriends, wives, or anything around. Um, and even when you're a member, certain events they can't go to. Um, so that limits their uh, involvement. But they are less scrutinized. Like they're, nobody's searching them. Nobody's really paying attention to what they're doing. Um, they, there's also like an underground chatter between old ladies. And, and you may get some intel because even though you're not supposed to talk to your old ladies about anything, these guys do. Um, so you can get some intel. The other option is to take another male you know, agent. And that's, that's happened many times where you've had two, three, four people in a chapter, certainly, you know, and, and some buddies of mine have done it that way. And they're like, Hey, the upside is you at least have a normal person to talk to yeah. when you're in there. But the other side of it is like, there's so many ways your story can get crossed up when you bring other people in because they yeah. start asking questions like, Hey, you've known him, you know, what, what did Ken think about this? Or what, what did Ken do last? And they start checking up on your story. It's the quickest and easiest way for them to, to get you crossed up. Um, so for me, it was always like, hey, I'd rather just do this on my own. And if I screw up, I screw up. It's on me. And it's not going to affect nobody but me. Yeah, I think also, man, the guys are so violent. Many of them are rapists and murderers. Like you could have, I, I don't know, I guess old ladies are probably off limits, but maybe they don't care. Or maybe they're too high on methamphetamine and they just go after her. And you're like, great, now she's with the guy who eats dead things with the blood fetish alone in a room somewhere and she doesn't have a phone and now like or, well, or they it, or they take it out on her if they don't like you i don't know does that happen well yeah and, and well that absolutely could happen but when you're so when you're a full patch you, they they have they also give you a property patch and so if if you're a member you have a property patch so if you say property of slam and that would go to my girlfriend wife or whatever it is they're protected if you will now it's not i wouldn't take it to the bank but it's better off than not but the bulk you know a good part of this investigation you're not a patch member so there is no property patch there is no protection and there's one meeting uh where some old ladies have been doing some stuff and, and one of the mother club members getting really pissed and they're like hey um i'm 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 sick and tired of these old ladies and their friends causing all these problems remember this 
rape them, beat them, kill them. We don't care, but they are not going to be talked. So they like laying this out. And so it puts you at risk. And, and in the book, I talk about one opportunity. It was, uh, no, it wasn't even an opportunity. It was something that happened that was, and it was 100% my fault, um, where I had, um, you know, my uh, undercover girlfriend there. And I was not a pastor. I had been kicked out of the club and, and I got kicked out for nothing that I did. The, the national vice president who vouched for me had tried a coup and tried to become the national president the night before. And, um, or actually, no, this goes back about a month or two before. And he gets beaten out of the club severely. And then everybody who had, um, that he had sponsored got kicked out of the club as well. So I was out, nothing to do with me. Um, and quite honestly, I was done. I, I just wanted to go home and go back to my normal life. Um, but some folks convinced me to just kind of hang around and see what would happen. Anyways, long story short, they, um, uh, you know, um, I ended up down at this mandatory as a civilian, not anything with the club. And um, we were over, uh, we weren't allowed to go in the compound of where all the pagans were because I wasn't a pagan. But some of the presidents had a motel nearby. And so we were over there and people were hanging out. And um, I had left her there with some old ladies in, in the room. And I, I was up front and, and Peter had walked up to me with his sergeant arms. He's like, hey, I want to talk to you. He's like, let's take a walk, which wasn't abnormal. And so we start walking. And before long, I realized, like, where are we going? And, like, you know, I felt like, hey, these guys are leading me away. And um, so I got this pit in my stomach. And I'm like, oh, shit, man. I, I, and we've walked, like, a fair distance. Um, and so I was like, hey, I just got to make a quick call. And so I called um, the female on the cover. And she didn't answer her phone. Oh, and man. as it turns out, she had the phone on vibrate, which is normal. That's what we always did. But it was sitting on a bed, so it didn't vibrate. And so, I mean, it did vibrate, but she didn't, you know. Right, really. she didn't hear it. So um, so I'm sitting there. I call multiple times, and, and I'm like, I cannot believe I let these guys lure me away. And um, so I it very awkwardly was like, hey, I got to go back. I got to take care of something. And they're like, wait, wait, we're not done. Hold on. And I'm like, no, I got to go. And there was no stopping me. I was going because, again, this is one of those things. You, you, if you have to, you come out and roll. Like, you, I didn't know, I didn't know what the hell was happening to her back there. So um, I'm trying not to run, but I'm walking as fast as I can. And I it, get back, and the in the doors, it was open when I left, and it was not all the way closed. It was a jar, but not by much. And so I went and pushed the door open, expecting to see the worst. And it was nothing. It was a bunch of you know old ladies hanging in there and talking. And she was one of them. And you know, it's like you lose your kid in the mall and then you yeah. find them. And, and like the first thing you do is yell at them. Um, mostly because you're just scared and you're just happy that they're there, but it's not how it comes across. Right. And and so I did. I'm like, what the hell are you answering your phone? You know, blah, blah. And it was totally on me. I never should have walked out of that room. I never should have left that area. Um, but just kind of, you know, a mistake that I made. And luckily, you know, nobody, you know, got hurt because of it. I, although it's in character for you to be kind of an asshole to your girlfriend as a outlaw biker guy, so, right? And yell totally. her in front of her friends. So. T- totally. And it was it was totally not even acting because I was, but again, it was mostly, I was yelling at myself uh, because I never, you know, I knew better. I should have never let it happen. How do you weigh keeping your cover versus someone else's well-being, right? The, the, the grossest guy in the book later on, or one of the, gro- it's hard to even keep him straight. They're all disgusting, right? But he tells you, oh, there's this girl hanging out at the tattoo shop who's like a young student, right? And, and it's a biker-owned tattoo shop. And he's like, I'm going to brutally rape and murder this woman because I want to. And you're like, that could have torn you out of the, your, your role, right? Because you have to make sure that this innocent girl doesn't get, doesn't have this yeah. happen to her. A hundred percent. And it, and it would have, you know, again, it comes back to you just kind of thinking real quickly, like, okay, what can I do? And this, this one was kind of slow developing over a period of probably, I don't know, a couple of weeks. Cause it started with a very attractive art major, um, comes by the chapter president's tattoo shop. And, um, she really gifted artists, but she didn't know how to tattoo. And there's a big difference between drawing it and then actually sure. you know, putting it on somebody's skin. So she was there kind of as an apprentice. And um, so he, he worked with it legitimately. But there was a couple of pagans who were there. And, you know, like they're like trying to flirt with it. And it was comical for me at the beginning because I'm sitting back. And there was like a big sofa in, in the uh, in the tattoo shop. And I'm looking and I'm like, you idiots. Like, go look in a mirror and then go look at this girl. <laughs> like, you really think you have a snowball's chance in hell of, of getting with her. Um, but then it, it went from being funny to like, oh, wait a minute, because Hogman started talking and he you know started getting more aggressive in what he was saying, not towards her, but the way he was looking at her, 
I'm like, man, this dude's like, he's heading down a path. And then eventually he was like, Hey, uh, I'm going to rape this girl. And I'm going to, you know, he was talking about what he was going to do to her. And, and so I was like, all right, well, obviously I'm not going to be able to, and you, like some people may talk to that stuff, you know, but this, like with this guy, I would never put it past him. Mm-hmm. And so I wasn't going to wait around to find out. And so I had approached her. There's one of the couple things I could do is come out of roll and take the whole thing down, or I could try to get her to go away. Um, and so I approached her and I basically said, Hey, listen, I could get, I, I could get myself in a world of trouble by even telling you this. I said, but you need to leave. You're not safe here. Uh, Hogman's very focused on you and this is not going to end well for you. You need to leave. Um, and I didn't mean need to leave like in the next three minutes, but like when you leave tonight, don't come back. Like mm-hmm. there's like, this is not, cause it was easy enough to just to be around her to make sure nothing was going to happen. Um, and to her credit, she did leave. Never saw her again. Smart. Um, and yeah, and she was she was gone. I'm sure she went to another tattoo parlor and got her training. She she probably. I mean, she, these guys are obvious creeps, right? It's not like this guy was undercover chewing on blood clots and all the stuff that he was doing. So he, he, she probably already had a bad vibe from him. And then you coming in being like, yeah, this this guy isn't just a gross guy that we can sort of like wave off. And she's right. like, yeah, I was already on the fence. I'll yeah, yeah see you never. And you can see how people are looking at you, yeah. you know, and there's like looking at you like hopeful and there's looking at you like you're a piece of meat. And mm-hmm. that's what it turned into for him. There's a war between the pagans and the hell's angels, among other gangs. Right. And they're dealing guns. Th- these illegal guns as felons. I, I, the whole time you're making a huge list of crimes. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. What are what's the most intense or severe felony you had a front row seat for? Was it some of these bomb making uh, bomb threats? And things like so, that. Well, the murder conspiracy was probably uh, the biggest, where they were talking about how they were going to kill certain people in, in a large part of them with the Hell's Angels, and they had very specific ways they were going about it. And there's some recordings that really laid out their intent and how they were going to do it. And some of it was with bombs. Uh, they had the bombs. We ultimately ended up getting some of them, um, you know, before the case was over. But um, but there was uh, there was gun trafficking, uh, drug trafficking, Vicar, you know, beatings. Like there was. There's a whole string of um, events. You know, eventually it became a RICO case and and prosecutors like organized as, crime case. Yeah, right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but as you know, to your point, like it, there'd be some days that not a lot was going on. Other days it'd be like five different things going on. And and then as you get later in the case, it's like okay, you have to sure up these charges by getting this conversation. So like if you had a bodyguard in statute where. Somebody's carrying a gun in defense of a felon who can't carry a gun. That's a, a federal offense. But you have to show that they knew that person was a felon. So then you basically have to have a conversation with them, somehow getting them to say or acknowledge that they knew this person was a felon. Um, so like some of those things to kind of tie up the, the loose ends of the case, the closer you get to the end. And then you have to freshen up the PC for the warrants because you could be in a house. And like PC I was in probable cause, right? Right, right. I appreciate you translating for no me. No problem, man. The, Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> they, but you would be, um, you know, like I'd be in Trucker's house. Um, who's one of, you know, the brothers, Roblox, um, uh, Hogman and Trucker. And I saw our gun there, but, you know, I'd seen it months before. So now I got to figure out a way to go back to Trucker's house to see if that gun's still in Trucker's house, you know, as the case is getting closer to coming down. Um, and so like a lot of that kind of activity as you're moving along and kind of putting those, because that's the whole reason you're there is, to, you know, to, to build the case. And listen, there was plenty of people, actually, there were some who could have been charged, who weren't charged. Um but the one there's, there's some there that didn't do anything illegal, so it's like okay, that's fine too. You know, you you're not going in with a, oh, I'm gonna get this these twenty guys in this chapter. No, I'm gonna go in and get whoever's doing what they're doing, and and you know, document and make sure I uh, put together a solid case. So for people who are maybe not American or, or their law background is not uh, not up to snuff, probable cause is what police have when they say, hey, I I see something illegal or smell something illegal in your car. Now I'm gonna search your car. You need that to get a warrant. So what you're talking about is if you saw a gun in someone's house eight months ago and it's illegal and maybe he had a bunch of drugs in his safe and some cash, you can't say, hey, eight months ago, this guy had something in there. You have to find a reason to go back in the house, look in there again when he's not looking, make sure that stuff is still in there. Then you can go back to the, the, the prosecutor, the judge, whatever, and say that stuff's still in there. I just saw it a couple days ago. The warrant, if we go and we search it, you're probably going to find it. And then that makes the warrant hold up in court when they're prosecuting. Because otherwise, 
you could have this old thing. You could even find it, and then they say, well, this probable cause is kind of nonsense. You saw something almost a year ago on that. You got a warrant. You went in there. Yeah, you found it. But that that's that's called fruit of the poison tree, and it's so that police don't uh, uh, overstep their bounds. And it it can really screw up a case, as I'm sure you've uh, seen and happen, probably had happen before. Sure. Yeah, and that's really what – so not a single one of these individuals went to trial because uh, the, uh, the evidence was overwhelming. But they all you – know, uh, I can't say they all. The majority of them – File motions, much to like what you were just describing, um, in hopes of being able to suppress some of the evidence. And yeah. um, in the end, you know, they weren't successful and, and they all pled guilty. So, you know, I was amazed at how cheap it is to have some of these crimes done. It really is dirty deeds done dirt cheap for some of these guys. There was one example in the book where I think you said you wanted to blow up someone's boat because they poured sugar in your gas tank. It's just kind of a nonsense story and this guy's like yeah no problem i've got a grenade or a homemade bomb or something and he's like yeah i'll blow up this guy's boat with you with an explosive which is like you know decades long felony to have an explosive use it to blow something up and he wanted like 300 bucks to do it right so yeah so the the, the whole story though is um he wasn't really charging to blow up the boat what it was is we knew they had what they referred to as christmas presents we knew they were bombs I had no I, I hadn't seen them yet and i didn't know where they were so I came up with this story. Like if I if I was in New York and I just said, "Hey, listen, I want to go blow up Jordan." Okay, the problem is they're going to go blow up Jordan. They're not even like I might not even know about it, and they're just going to go do it because they think they're doing me a favor. Um, so I had to have an environment where I could control it. So I said to him, "Hey, you know, because part of my cover story was that I poach lobsters. It allowed me the few times that I could go and say, hey, 'Hey, I'm going out poaching.' They couldn't track me because I was out on the water, and that would allow me to go home or do yeah. you know, go see the shrimp, whatever it is I had to do. So. Part of the story was, hey, you know, these poachers, and it's true, if, you know, you get caught poaching lobsters, watch out for the lobster man who's coming along with a sawed-off shotgun because he's going to blast you. You know, they uh, they take that stuff serious. So, so poaching lobsters is what you go up to somebody else's traps and you just empty them out and steal his, yeah. his catch? Take, yeah, take their, take their lobsters. And so, um, you know, the so what I was saying is I was out there poaching, you know, and in, in, I got into this battle with this other guy. And anyways, long story short is he poured sugar into the, into my, the tanks of my boat. And, you know, d destroy my engines. Um, and I wanted to blow up his boat. And so when I told that to Izzo, he's, um, he's like, hey, I may be able to help you with that. And so I'm like, all right, well, hey, that'd be great. We talked about it a little bit, but we didn't, we didn't iron it out. We didn't have any set plan to do this. But I knew that he wasn't going to be able to go and use it on somebody in New York or something that I couldn't control. Long story short... Um, part, uh, again, another part of my backstory is that I did collections for my boss who would, you know, who's doing, running some numbers and some things and, and I would help do collections and I'd get a piece of that action. So you're like so collecting was, money from gambler gamblers or something like that? Right, exactly. And it's just the more of like the small time criminal stuff, the more legitimate it makes you be. And so part of that was we set this up um, where it was agents, but I had set it up that I was doing these collections and that Izzo was going to come with me. Oh, so it's fake um, collections to like boost your, it's like street theater stuff, right? Is, that's exactly what it is, street theater. And it, it builds my credibility. And so he comes up to do this and it, and it still has danger to it because if he goes and does something crazy and now it's an agent that I've put in that risk. So I told him, I said, hey, the last guy who did this with me, he got too handsy and I threw him out and he's never did it again. You do one thing that I tell you not to do, then you're out. And so he's like, oh, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You know, don't worry. He was just, I was just going to pay him a couple hundred bucks, you know, for, for doing it. So anyways, he, he comes up and, um, and so we meet at a 99 restaurant. And uh, when I say come up, it was up to the Boston area. So we're in the 99 restaurant. We have a beer. Uh, we're eating something. And so we're just about done. And so I was like, I got to go take a leak. So I go in the bathroom and uh, he follows me in. And uh, I'm like, this is a little weird. But then he's like kind of standing behind me at the urinal. I'm like, this is really fucking weird. So, um, you know, I finished doing what I'm doing. And I turn around. He's got one of those uh, long uh, bike trench coats, you know, the oil slick ones. And so as I turn, he like like a flasher, you know, whip, <laughs> whips open his jacket. And he's got a bomb in the inner pocket of the jacket. And I'm like, holy shit. He's got this bomb inside this restaurant. Like that's like it can't happen. So I'm like. Hey, bro, like, listen, let's get out of here, man. We don't want to get caught with that thing. And listen, I just want him the hell away from all these people. Got him. I say, hey, go meet him by my truck. So I'll pay the bill. So he went out. And anytime you say I'll pay the bill, they're going to run out the door anyways. <laughs> so I uh, so I go pay the bill real quick and we get out, out there. And I'm like, hey, we got work to do, man. We can't be driving around this thing. And so the, I had one of those big star from Dunkin' Donuts uh, cups. So um, gave me the bar. I put it into the, the, the cup and I left it in my vehicle. I said, we'll take your vehicle. And uh, 
So we did, and I faked making some phone calls. We went out to these, you know, the, the street theater, and uh, I said, "Hey, listen, the boats out. Um, you know, he's out at sea, and he's like, oh, we'll just wait.'" And I'm like, "No, you don't understand, man. He could be out for days. We could be sitting on the dock for days waiting for him to come back." He's like, "Oh, fuck." And then I'm like, "Listen, I talked to my boss. He'll give you 300 bucks for it, and then I'll just take care of it whenever it comes back in, or he'll take care of it himself." And he's like, "All right, cool. He gets 300 bucks, right?" So. He, yeah, I give him the 300 bucks. He leaves me with the bomb. Um, oh, so he, he did, sold it to you. Yeah. He basically, yeah, he sold it to me. And so now at least we knew what this, it was a high explosive wrap of steel, but it was a legit device. And so, um, but when we got back to New York and we had church roadblock, who's, you know, one of the more intelligent of the crew, um, he caught wind of what had happened. And, um, so in church, he's like, Hey, where's the bomb? And I'm like, he used it, sunk the boat. And he's like, you know who leaves or takes stuff like that? Cops. That's what cops do. Now I'm thinking, shit, he thinks I'm a cop. But as it turned out, as the story, or the conversation went like for another minute, he thought my boss was a cop. And so his whole thing was like, hey, how do you know that he used it in, in sunk the boat? How do you know this? How do you know that? And I'm like, listen, you know, you guys know I dive. I'll dive and get photos. I'll, I'll tell him to, you know, tell me exactly where it was. I'll get pictures. Of, he's like, get the fucking pictures of the boat. And he goes, and if I end up in a jail cell, and he's pointing at me and Izzo, he's like, you two better pray to God you're not in a cell anywhere near me because I'm going to kill the both of you. Like, he was, he was hot uh, that, that, you know, the device had gotten left behind. So did you get the pictures? I mean, how did you manage that? So, so then, so I went up, and so I, I just kind of strung it along for a little bit. And eventually, it, 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 so then these guys, it, it's like, if it doesn't happen right away, it's not going to happen. So like, I think it's time and we never talked about it. So it wasn't like in 10 days, they felt good about it. Nobody got arrested. But as time went by, I just stopped bringing it up. And, and I, I never brought it up, but he brought it up a couple of times. I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm working on it. I'm going to make it happen, man. Next time I go up. But uh, then he just kind of dropped it. And I think it was more because nobody went to jail for it. And so he's yeah. like, okay. Yeah, you know. if they were going to arrest us, they'd have done it by now, right? That kind of that kind of thing. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Man, I, you always mentioned during your interactions with these guys that they might know you're a cop or they might have a suspicion, and you're worried about them obviously shooting or killing you. You're that's one example. There was another one where you're moving a dead body in the woods, and you're like, "Oh man, is are they making me dig this grave for myself?" Do you think that these guys were actually suspicious, or was this just your mind playing tricks on you because of the pressure? No, I think, well, I think it's a combination, right? You, you're, you know, and it's not even mind's pain. You, you always have to have your guard up. You always have to be thinking, what if? And um, now the, the moving the body, uh, without getting too far into that story, because I don't want it to be a spoiler, but the, there we learned um, from post-arrest interviews that they had gotten suspicious. And um, it was never really clear what it was that tripped them that they felt was um, suspicious. But I had, um, I just bought some drugs off of Tracy. It was at the undercover house. And um, and I got back inside the house actually to put the drugs away. And when I came out, there's a group of the pagans were in the driveway. And you know how you walk out and you know everyone's talking about you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they all stopped talking. And so that happened. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And um, and we later learned that they, they had thought that there was... Um, that something, you know, had happened that, that I was a copper informant and I'm not sure which is worse. And, you know, on day one, if they figure you're a copper informant, big deal. They're just going to say, hey, cop, leave. Um, day, you know, 100, when you've got charges on three quarters of them, that, that's not going to end as, as easily. Um, and so, you know, as it went on, they, they felt, you know, more secure um, that I wasn't. And, you know, hence I got more and more involved in some of the heavy hitting things that were going on in the, in the gang, which then raises the stakes, which makes it more difficult to, to stay in. What made you finally pull the trigger on this one and have everyone arrested? You know, what, what was sort of like the, all right, here's the flag, like, let's pull it, let's do this. I mean, you have, so the investigation goes on and you have all these different times. Some of them are like things that they did that you put you in a bad spot. Like, you know, I was talking about having to kill that guy and throw him off. Other stuff was just the dumb luck. Like you dodged a bullet, you know, there was, you know, I mentioned to you when I got kicked out of the club, I was supposed to be doing guard duty out in front of the clubhouse. Um, I got kicked out of the club, so I obviously wasn't going to be doing guard duty. So the Sergeant Arms was out there and the Hells Angels rolled up in the clubhouse. They surrounded the clubhouse um, and they beat the Sergeant Arms with ball peen hammers, fists, feet. Um, beat, he had he got med flighted out and that should have been me. Uh, it would have been me if I hadn't gotten kicked out. Like, dumb luck, I got kicked out. 
there's another incident right not too long after that when um, I was a sergeant at arms and we had been on this big run. There was like 30 of us. And um, the way it works is the highest ranking rides front left. And then it, the next highest and it works its way all the way back to the back of the pack. And so we had gotten back and the, and the chapter president had said, hey, Hogman and, and Slam, I need you guys to go pick this up. Something at Home Depot. So like, all right, so I pull out. I'm the sergeant at arms. He's the uh, vice president. Vice president, as I mentioned before, doesn't have any status if the president's alive and out of prison. And he was. So I pull out front left. I'm the highest rank guy. I should be riding front left. He pulls out like around me into the other lane of traffic to, to get over to my left. And so I'm like, whatever, man. I'm a make-believe biker. I don't give a rat's ass if I'm riding front left, front right. Whatever, man. You want to ride front left? Go ahead. We don't get a quarter mile down the road. And uh, a minivan splatters him on the road. And it wasn't his fault. It was the minivan's fault. Splatters him. He codes out. They bring him back to life. Um, he ends up coding out like two or three times on the, on the way to the hospital and at the hospital. That should have been me. If, if he hadn't done what he had done, it absolutely would have been the minivan hit me. So it's like, it's almost like Russian roulette, you know, at some point. But the, the real driver is the further you get into this and the more trusted you are. Um, they assigned me to this, what they call it, 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 this hit squad inside the gang. And most of the gang members don't even know that this group exists within. Um, and it's selected by uh, mother club members of what they consider to be their heavy hitters. You know, the ones that can do the real down and dirty work. And so Hellboy, um, who's, you know, his pitches in the book, and, and he had approached me. He's like, hey, they want you to be a part of this. And so I was. And um, and so they, we were going to be targeting Hell's Angels and uh, we were going to be killing them. So you had that and you have that lack of control. And then I had I had gotten arrested uh, during the uh, during the case, legitimately got arrested with a gun by the local um, gang task force. And so I, I spent some time in jail and, and but that case was going through the courts and that in and of itself. So it's like the fuse is burning, like, the, you know, at some point this had to come down. But at the same time, we had other elements of the crimes that we had to prove. So it was like you know, chicken and the egg. We're like scrambling as fast as we can. They had to get all the evidence together. And like, I was originally supposed to come out at Christmas. Then it went to June. And the June one was a real date. Like I actually thought I was going to be out at that point. And then it got continued until October. And that's somewhat demoralizing too. Because, yeah. you know, it, not only for me, but my family. My family's expecting to know he's going to be home. And now since like, oh, I'll see him in four months. Yeah, cancel all the summer plans. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So after all these guys get busted, aren't you worried that then they're going to try and kill you? Because I, I would imagine it's unsettling knowing that like 1,300 scumbag bikers want to kill you in the most painful way they can imagine. And also <laughs> their patron support clubs too probably have your photo somewhere. Yeah, no, there's plenty of photos that were... Um, were out there, but they, uh, yeah, they did put two contracts out on me after, um, after the case came down. And, um, one of them, um, they investigated, I, I won't go into a lot of details on it, but uh, you know, the, the recording of that hit did not come out. Um, uh, but it was an active conversation. They knew, um, there was a lot of protection, um, put into place. Uh, I mean, I, there was agents at, at my house for, for months afterwards, but they're, uh, a lot of other safeguards and also um, they monitor, you know, there's, listen, there's informants, part of these gangs, there's a lot of information that comes out to law enforcement, but they're con it's constantly, and to this day, still monitor all that, that activity. And anytime something comes out or there's a reference or anything to it, you know, I get notified and the agency looks into it and, you know, investigates it. So um, it's, it's part of what you do. Um, and there's also, I will say for, for some of them, yeah, the, you know, obviously they were mad enough to put a hit out on me. Uh, for others, they're like, hey, that's the job. Like, better to be a cop than an informant, I think, um, mm -hmm. because at least with a cop, it's like your job. And they're like, hey, he's doing his job like we're doing our job. So it's a little bit of both. But yeah, you always, you know, you, you, you're very wary of your surroundings and, and you try to do what you can to minimize it. Are you worried about it at all now? I mean, it's been like 10 years, but some of those guys are still probably in the gang doing stuff and probably higher ranking now, right? Or no? Yeah, and, and there's still some that are in jail um, that will get out. But there's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I don't know that you ever totally relax about it, mm. but I don't live my life looking over my shoulder either. You know, I, I've, I've gotten on with my life. Um, and, you know, like I said, a bunch of time has passed. Some, some of them are dead. You know, some, some are still, you know, active. Um, but you just, you know, you live your life. And, and, you know, you try to be smart about it and know that your agency's got your back. And, um, you know, that's all you can really do.
once you're a part of a big operation like this, I assume you can't do undercover work again, right? Because you've met, like, thousands of scumbags over the years. Like, someone could easily recognize you at this point after all that time in the game, right? Um, well, I did undercover work after this. So, um, yeah, that's not 100%. You know, it depends on the case. And it depends on... So, like, none of these guys went to trial. They all ended up pleading guilty. So there wasn't any big dramatic trial that had a lot of media coverage. Um, and so you could have the simplest of case that generates a whole lot of, you know, whether it be media attention or if there was a shooting and that kind of coverage, um, or, um, you know, or you can kind of fly low. And so, I, I mean, I did undercover for, you know, 20 years and um, was able to do that successfully. Um, now, writing this book, yeah, well, now if it's I was over. still on a job, yeah, 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 it was over anyways, but if it wasn't, it would be now. But you're retired now, right? I take I it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You must still have that those that axe handle and those that pagan the cut, the leather the jacket and the patches and stuff and the ring and all that stuff, right? You still got that stuff? Yeah, it's all locked away in a bank vault. Um, all right. you know, it's uh but yeah, I, I keep it more for training purposes. Okay. Um so cuz you know a lot of that stuff means there's, there's messaging behind a lot of the patches and a lot of those other things. So when I speak to law enforcement groups, I'll sometimes bring that out um and, you know, I always get people like, hey, you know, would you, you mind if I take a picture of you in your colors? I'm like, uh, never happened. So the day I came out, I swore I'd never put them on again. And I never have. Yeah, I don't blame you. It's kind of, I mean, I don't blame you at all. You're not, it's not like you're dressing up as somebody you admire, right? This no, is, no uh, I, I hated wearing them when I had to wear them. Yeah. So why would I wear them if I don't, you know? Um, and then there's other people who'd be like, hey, could I take a picture with the colors on? I'm like, if that ever gets out, good luck, because it's not going to end well for you, because, you know, they take this stuff really serious. Uh, but there, there is a training value behind those. Yeah, not not only them taking a picture with something they're not supposed to be wearing, but your cut is yeah. definitely like, oh, yeah, so not yeah. only are you wearing something you're not supposed to be wearing, it's the one from the undercover cop that put away like a how yeah, many dozen yeah. of our <laughs> brethren. Yeah, it's like the worst yeah. version you could find. Um, it's, yeah. What do you miss about the biker world now that you're completely out of the game? There's got to be something. No. Nah. No, now, I, I, now we'll say, you know, people ask me all the time, like, hey, do you still ride? And it, people ask, did you ride before? Yeah, I absolutely did. Um, and when I came out of this case, I sold my bike and I didn't ride for a long period of time because it took away the fun of riding, you know, riding at 110 miles an hour, two feet off the person in front of you, one gear down. It's not fun. It's not relaxing by any stretch of the imagination. And it just I got burnt out on it. Um, I've gotten back into riding again. So that, that's been a good thing. Um but the, the, I really don't, maybe a little bit of the, the chess match of, um, you know, how you're strategically putting together your case and trying to stay one step ahead. Um, but no, I've moved on, you know, um, it, it's, it, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I wouldn't do it again. Um, and I hope others do because, it, and that's why I, t you know, teach and, and talk to law enforcement crews because I think it's one of the few ways that you can get to the hierarchy, the shot callers, because, Without being a part of the group, you're not going to get there. You you don't even miss the barbecues, the food. I will say they they did have some good food, man. They there's a couple of them, particularly Roadblock, who could cook. I mean, now he cooked with every of the worst ingredients, so that's probably why it tasted so good. But <laughs> he the dude could cook. Um, he, it's still to this day the best uh, brisket I've ever had. So. Yeah, I can, I'm just imagining like, hey, you think this meth is good? You should tr yeah. gotta try the <laughs> yeah. brisket. <laughs> Try his brisket. Yeah, that was, and that was the one thing I could eat as much as I wanted. So that was always a good thing. It, I'll tell you one an embarrassing thing. Don't ever go to a, a, a Chinese food buffet with these guys because they're like animals. I mean, it's just <laughs> it's embarrassing. There's food flying everywhere. It's just, it's ugly. Using their hands to get the chicken yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah oh, my exactly. God. Man, I've kept you for too long. Thank you so much. This is fascinating stuff, really. And thank you for what you did as well. I'm sure that we are safer not having some of these horrendous human beings out in society, even if they're detached from society no i appreciate it I appreciate you having me on you know being able to tell my story thanks for checking out this entire episode of the jordan harbinger show if you're interested in exploring this topic further check out the jordan harbinger show podcast feed we dive even deeper on this and many other topics in the audio podcast i also close open loops cover things discussed off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, subscribe.